someone else ran for me or nothing special. Sorry? There's been a change in this case. Uh, no, I don't, I don't. Yeah, I've not seen it. I've not checked it. Um, maybe they changed between like between now and between now and now. And the Greek market. So, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see that uh, almost all of you survived the weekend. Uh, be ready because tomorrow weather forecasts are indicating uh, something like minus nine. Yeah, that's, so, that's what I could see. But in, the, in this case, it's the best thing to, to cope with this kind of problem is just to stay inside the building. Because you stay here, you study, you work, and so there is no problem. Uh, there is no special announcement to be done. So, I mean, apart that, you have received uh, uh, an email about uh, uh, a change in the schedule of next week, I think. And also, probably we will receive soon some exercises from, from Gregory. So, people will do the exercises because self evaluation is uh, uh, as important as evaluation done by somebody else. And, uh, okay, then, enjoy the lecture. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, so maybe uh, just to uh, repeat or rephrase what uh, Andrea said, uh, you should have received an email from Erika um, with a, a short exercise sheet. So I tried to produce some uh, questions that uh, I think should be quite uh, typical of what you should expect for the exam. So let's, I mean, I would strongly recommend you, suggest you to uh, Try to, 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 to look at it, uh, work on it, and uh, you will get a correction tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, and that will be also useful for me to have uh, feedback from you. I mean, whether it's too easy, too difficult, uh, whatever, to uh, more or less gauge the, the level and uh, write an appropriate uh, exam. OK, but try to make it seriously. OK, so. Uh, and also, you will also uh, you will also actually uh, receive. I mean, two links. I mean, with two references um, by myself and my colleague Satya. I mean, okay, these are not, of course, the the, the only uh, source of information that you should have about it. But at least I know what is what is inside these papers, uh, and uh, I know that they will be useful. So one concerns this uh, more or less the description of this uh, maze model. And this third order, I mean, this phase transition that we want to describe here. Um, so this is one of the two papers. And another one uh, actually concerns the large deviations. Uh, very brief introduction to it that I gave uh, on Saturday, and that, that I will briefly recall it. Um, so, right. So this is what, uh, what we were uh, talking about uh, on Saturday. So basically, we were again looking at this, uh, this maze model. You remember this uh, quite simple uh, interacting uh, uh, species uh, model. And the question is whether uh, one can compute the stability, the probability that the system is stable. Uh, and uh, we had indications from, uh, from maze and, and collaborators later on that uh, if you look at the probability this probability of stability as a function of, of alpha, or instead as a function of 1 over alpha, uh, what you see in the large end limit uh, is that there is a transition between uh, a phase which is uh, always uh, stable at a low interaction strength, while it becomes uh, 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 stable uh, when alpha, uh, sorry, it's stable, excuse me. So it's, it's stable when alpha, uh, when alpha is small, that means 1 over alpha is large, so in that region, the probability that the system is stable is 1. But on the other hand, when alpha is large, that means w equal 1 over alpha small, uh, this uh, system becomes uh, unstable with probability 1. Now, uh, the nice, and that was the motivation, but ni the nice thing is that this, this probability is precisely related to the, 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 the uh, distribution of the largest eigenvalue of some uh, matrix models, and uh, these uh, matrix models are actually called uh, these uh, Gaussian ensembles, and usually they are parameterized by uh, uh, a number, a real number, uh, beta. So they are called the Gaussian beta ensembles. And for such ensembles, the, the joint law of the lambda i's, so that means you, 
the joint law of the eigenvalues, uh, which are real numbers here, is known explicitly and is known under this rule. Okay? So again, I mentioned, uh, I started with this simplest uh, example, or at least the most natural example, I should say. It's not the simplest, but it's the most natural, certainly, uh, in particular in this context, which corresponds to beta equal 1, which is the GOE ensemble. Okay? So that's the case where you take a matrix, which is, which is real symmetric, and you put random numbers, Gaussian or numbers, in it, independent ones. And of course, because it's real symmetric, the eigenvalues are real, and the joint law of the, 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 the eigenvalues is written there. Now, an interesting fact, uh, an interesting property, which actually was already uh, known by, noticed by, by Dyson, uh, is that this joint law can be interpreted as the uh, Boltzmann weight of uh, uh, charge, charged particle systems uh, interacting via this uh, logarithmic uh, Coulomb interaction, repulsive one, with a minus sign here, and confined in an harmonic, in an harmonic way. So this is what is usually called as the Coulomb gas. Coulomb, because this corresponds, this logarithmic interaction corresponds to the Coulomb interactions in 2D. But of course, here, my particles live on a line. So they, they are confined on a line. And on top of that, they feel this confining potential. Now we saw, I explained to you that uh, as a result of the competition between these two terms, between this confining potential and these repulsive interactions, uh, the density uh, turns out to have a finite support. So that means that the, the, in the large end limit, the particles uh, are confined uh, on a given interval. And uh, for n large, uh, we've seen that uh, uh, the density, if I look at the density rho of lambda, uh, which is just 1 over n sum over i, sorry, delta of lambda minus lambda i averaged. Well, this goes to a limiting uh, profile, and this limiting profile uh, is as a support on the interval minus square root of 2 plus square root of 2, and this is known under the Wigner semicircle, okay? So when n goes to infinity, uh, this goes to this 1 over square root of pi, square root of 2, minus lambda square. OK, so that's Wigner. This is called Wigner semicircle. OK? Yes? Yeah. Sorry? This term. OK, so this term actually tends to confine the, the particles uh, in the middle of the trap. OK, so in other words, if you don't have this, uh, this interaction term here, OK, then this confining potential really uh, favor the configurations where all the lambdas are close to zero. OK, so this term, I mean, if you think Eventually, what will happen is that uh, the system will try to minimize its energy. And if you only have this confining term here, well, all the particles would sit at lambda i equal to 0, okay? because uh, they all want to, all the particles want to minimize their kinetic energy. Now, this is not possible. I mean, this is not possible. Uh, this will cost a very huge energy to the system because of this uh, repulsive interaction. You remember that uh, I insisted on that, that in these matrix models, uh, that the two eigenvalues don't want to sit close, close by to each other. And there is a so-called level repulsion phenomenon, which can be viewed as a, as a, as a logarithmic interaction. And the competition between this uh, confining potential and this repulsive one effectively a result in the fact that the density has a finite support. Okay, so the particles will be spread over this uh, interval minus square root of two plus square root of two, and given by this uh, Wigner semicircle. And yeah. Yes, but uh, okay. At this level, at this level of description, it's uh, it's a little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot really describe it. One one needs to go one step further. So that means that one has to write an equation for this rho of lambda, 
Uh, and when you write this, uh, the equation for this rho of lambda, then you see that mathematically, I mean, the only possibility is that you have, uh, you don't necessarily have a finite support. But there is no, as far as I know, there is no simple physical argument at this level uh, that tells you that. So that's, that's something that really depends pretty much on the, on the type, yeah, on the type of interactions and the type also of, 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 of potentials that you have. That's true. So by changing the measure on your uh, matrices, you can, uh, okay, you can change essentially this, this, this potential here. Okay, so this one is quite universal. I mean, it's quite universal and is really, um, yeah, this, revel this uh, repulsion that I mentioned. But you can actually tune this, this, uh, this potential. And it might happen that if the, uh, the, 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 so if you change the potential in general, you will change the, the, the shape of the density. And if your potential is not sufficiently confining, it might be that they are widespread. And the limit is basically when this, uh, this uh, potential here goes logarithmically. Basically, this is this log that you have, okay. roughly speaking. <clears throat> but this would drive me a little bit too far, but uh, that these are very interesting questions in the context of RMT, of course. So my point was here to, uh, to try to say something about lambda max. So of course, I mean, there are many things, many interesting other things to say about these this matrix models. I want to focus here on lambda max because this is a lecture on extreme statistics first. And on the other hand, because in our model, um, we have seen that this is really the, the object that we are after. Now, because of that, uh, because of the fact that uh, we have a, a finite support here, uh, then what I said, uh, what I tried to convince you is that this lambda max, when n goes to infinity, uh, will uh, almost surely converge to square root of 2, which means that uh, the, uh, the probability that lambda max uh, is, say, smaller than uh, w, when n is very large, okay, so that just to make a connection with this quantity here, uh, will be indeed, uh, will indeed have this form with a WC, which is precisely square root of 2. Okay? Is that fine? Right? Because I'm saying that lambda max with probability 1, essentially when n goes to infinity, the distribution will be a simple delta function, and the cumulative distribution is just a step function. Okay, so already at this stage, we can uh, understand the origin of this transition here, and we can pinpoint now the exact value of this WC that may found, which is exactly square root of two, and which corresponds with the edge of the support here. Okay. Now, we could say more, and we want to say more, uh, and what uh, we said before, or yesterday, or not, not yesterday, but Saturday, um, essentially I first discussed what I call the typical fluctuations of lambda max. And uh, what I showed you is that uh, using a similar argument, uh, and using the, the argument that we had constructed from the IID case, that we got from the IID case, we were able to show that uh, basically the typical fluctuations are such that uh, lambda max, sorry, is of that form a n, which is here square root of two, plus b n, which we estimated to be n to the power minus two thirds, times a random variable, and this random variable, uh, okay, I propose you to write it as square root of two times uh, some chi here. Let's call it chi beta, because it in general depends on the index beta that you have here. And what I showed, I mean, what I explained to you is that the typical fluctuations, uh, so now if I look at the P, the cumulative distribution of this random variable, so chi beta here, so that should be only asymptotically true when n is large. So chi beta here is a random variable that does not depend on n anymore. And this P of chi beta, this is what I call uh, F beta of x, which is the tracy rhythm distribution. Okay. Now, I will come back to this Tracy-Rhythm distribution, but okay, I told you that it can be written in, in some cases 
uh, in terms of the solution of some uh, differential equations. Um, it has some very nice uh, uh, non-Gaussian tails, uh, exponential minus mod x cube on the left, exponential minus x to the power 3 by 2 on the right. So it's clearly a non-Gaussian distribution, quite asymmetric also. But what I sort of try to, to suggest you or to explain you, uh, to tell you, is that in fact these, these typical fluctuations are very important and if I have time at the end I will show you that this trace iridium distribution actually is very important in many models of statistical mechanics. But for our purpose that means to understand this transition, if I want to understand the nature of this transition, I need to know more about the, the, the fluctuations and I would like to say something not only about the typical fluctuations but about the large fluctuations. So typically I would like to say something about uh, the case where uh, the deviation from square root of two are typically of order one. So one question would be what's the probability, for instance, that all the eigenvalues are negative? That means what's the probability that lambda max is smaller than zero, for instance, here? This is a perfectly well-defined question. I mean, actually here W does not stop at zero. I mean, it's well-defined for any values of U. But of course, when you start to ask or to probe these large deviations, you uh, you, you, you quit, you, you leave the, the, the regime where the, the, the Tracy rhythm uh, distribution applies and you enter into the large deviation regimes. Okay? Now, uh, of course, uh, I didn't have time really to do a proper course on large deviations and that's not really the, the, the purpose here. But nevertheless, I tried to give you uh, some basics about large deviations. And that's what I will discuss uh, this morning in detail, in more detail, say. So now I would like to understand what the large deviations are. And that means that I would like now to understand the regime where essentially lambda max minus square root of two is in general of order one, or say of order uh, some powers of n, which is much larger than minus two thirds. Okay, so that means that lambda max is typically in general uh, uh, that could be of order minus two thirds plus epsilon, with epsilon strictly positive. Here we essentially uh, just look because this is the interesting regime. Uh, we look at the case where lambda max minus square root of two is of order one. And so uh, I illustrated this concept of large deviations on a very, uh, very simple models, um, which is uh, which was what which is this, which, which which was this uh, uh, coin tossing uh, coin tossing problem. Uh, yeah, so I just make this small detour. Uh, as an example, uh, I look at this, I looked at this coin tossing problem, uh, where you have, uh, again, uh, a head or tail with probability, would just be a head tail with probability half. And uh, I was just looking at uh, NH, which is the number, the number of tail and which you still can be right as a sum of the IID random variables with sigma i equal to 0 or 1, 1 if h and 0. Okay, it's a bit cryptic, but uh, in principle I did that in detail last time. Uh, so now if you look at the distribution of nh is equal to m, so in if, say if you plot it, So you can compute that explicitly. Let me plot the log of pH, the log of this quantity as a function of m. And uh, what we saw, of course, is that this is centered around the mean value, which is n by 2. Okay, on average, you will have n by 2 uh, heads. And now you have some distribution around this n over 2. So we know that, uh, in general, I mean, the typical fluctuations will be Gaussians. But I convinced you that there is actually uh, a more general regime, which I called uh, the large deviation. So, in general, what we saw is that basically uh, this uh, P yeah. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So if I want to, if I look at this probability here, so that's the log of prob, excuse me. 
Okay, so what we saw last, what I showed you uh, last time is that this probability actually uh, has a large deviation form, which had this form here. And we could compute explicitly this function phi. Phi of C was basically this uh, entropy, at this entropy form, C log C plus 1 minus C log 1 minus C plus log 2. It has a minimum, sorry, a max, yeah, minimum uh, around uh, n by 2. So if you plot log of this, basically this is minus n times phi of mn. So what you would see essentially is you can compute that explicitly. So okay, you, you would essentially get something like that. And uh, what you find uh, is that locally here, you have a quadratic behavior. And this quadratic behavior tells you that locally you have something which looks like a Gaussian. Okay? Now, the Gaussian approximation is very good if you, if you plot it very close to the, to the, to the, the top. But uh, it gets uh, worse and worse when you go to the tails. Okay, so that's the quadratic approximation. Okay, so it took me some time uh, to remind everything, but I thought it could be useful. I mean, otherwise, uh, I was fearing to, to, to lose you just uh, from the beginning. Is that fine? So now what I want to do is the same kind of analysis, but for the distribution of lambda max. OK? So that's something, uh, of course, much more complicated. And uh, one thing which is also quite different compared to the, to the case of the sum is that if you look at the large deviations on the right of the typical value or on the left, they are actually quite different. And this can be understood physically. And I will show you why and how uh, later on. But let me first you let me first sorry quote the results, and I will then uh, try to to understand what, what is going on. Okay, so this this uh, p you remember is a is a um, is a probability, it's not a cumulative distribution. So now I, I really want to, 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 to give you the, the result for the large deviations uh, uh, for lambda max. Okay, so let's, let's go. Okay, so for this, I will look at the cumulative, sorry, the, the, the density. Okay, so up to now we were looking at uh, this guy. So to make contact with this, uh, I prefer to look at the PDF. Okay, so that's the DDW of that. Okay. Now, how does it look like? So there are three regimes basically. Well, there is the first regime that we already understood, uh, which is the regime where uh, essentially lambda max minus sorry uh, W minus square root of 2 is of order n to the power minus 2 thirds. Okay, so that's the central regime. And that's basically uh, the, 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 maybe it's good to have a picture at the same time. Similar picture, but for, for lambda max. <clears throat> okay, I just keep this, this for comparison. So let me do a picture uh, of the distribution of lambda max. So I, I could plot it. Maybe it's better. So again, I, I, I like this, this drawing here. I'm looking at the density, minus square root of 2 plus square root of 2. And now I'm, I look, on the, I, I, I plot on the same graph, I plot this, this PDF here. Okay, so that's d, dw of p of lambda max smaller than w. Okay, let me do it in blue. So there is a regime again, which is around square root of two, and which we have described, and which is basically this guy here. Okay, and it has a width n to the power minus two thirds, and this is the Tracy rhythm regime. Okay, so that regime actually we know already. 
And this is basically the, so this is Tracy Widom, okay? So Tracy Widom here, so this is the derivative of F beta, and the good scaling variable is actually W minus square root of two, and then you need to multiply by N to the power two third, and you also need to multiply by square root of two, and since it's the derivative, this is square root of two, N to the power two thirds. Okay, is that fine, this form here? It's not the, the, the form that I, that, okay, I probably never wrote it in this form, but uh, is it okay? All right, so why do I write it this way? Simply because we know that lambda max minus square root of two, uh, I already told you is of that form, is one over square root of two n to the power minus two third chi beta. So you see that chi beta, I can again write it as square root of two times n to the power two third times lambda max minus square root of two. Okay, and that's the variable that admits the Tracy wheel. Okay, so that's this variable here. Okay, so now the question is what happens on both sides. So let's first look at this regime here, where essentially you, you look at what, what happens there. Okay, so there is, of course, this regime, the two regimes that are discussing, in fact, are smoothly connected. They don't need to, to be okay. I'm, I'm reproducing the same stupid, uh, okay, they, of course, they do not, okay, it's basically like this, okay? So you have this regime here. So this is the left, right, left large deviation. Now, what is the form of this, of this scale in here? Well, it has a very different form and also a different from what we I've seen here, although it has a bit the flavor of this, and it actually reads like this, at the, the leading order, it's exponential of minus n square times some function phi minus of w, and plus there are terms of order n, which I will not write. So that's basically uh, for w minus square root of two uh, should be of order one, and uh, square and w smaller than square root of two. Okay, so that's the left. So that's really this part here. Okay, so roughly speaking, you have here a probability which decays extremely slowly and which is of that form exponential minus n square times something. It's very, very small. Okay, so this, uh, I will explain it to you a bit, uh, a bit later, but uh, at the moment, just notice that this is different from it, okay? So what is the interpretation of this, phi, of this phi, phi minus? Probably, I can already say it now. You remember that I can interpret this, distribu this cumulative distribution as the distribution of the, uh, as a partition function of a Coulomb particle in presence of a wall. So now you are pushing this, these particles here, okay, with the wall which is there, you are pushing it, and because you are on that, on that left side, you really are, you are really pushing all your particles here, okay? Now, what you, this phi minus, n square phi minus, is essentially the energy that you need to put all these particles on the left of square root of two. And if you think a little bit, you, you remember that the energy is the sum over ij of the sum of log of lambda i minus lambda j. And this term here, you see, I mean, I've n squared, it has actually n squared term. And that's this n squared that you see here, okay? So the energy that you need uh, to, put, to push all your particles on the left scales like, like, like n squared, okay? Because you really need all of them to rearrange, and that will really imply a strong modification of the Wigner semicircle law. That means the density when you push the wall here will not at all look like the, 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 the Wigner density. And the energy cost uh, for this global rearrangement, because of this uh, n square uh, n square term, that means because, the, because of the n square scaling of the energy, again, all the particles, it's a kind of mean field model here, right? I mean, all the particles are interacting with everyone. 
And so you have n square, and it's the number, simply the, the, the number of interaction terms is basically n and minus 1 over 2. So that scale like n square over 2, that's this n square. Fine. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah it, it is within the exponential, yes, yes. So that means that you have, this is the, the, the lowest order, and then you will have a term which is like n times, uh, okay, phi minus uh, uh, 1, if you want, of w, okay. And then there will be the next term, which actually will be of order log n, in many cases, much. But you can actually, in principle, I will not uh, mention that, but of course, I mean, you, of course. Uh, this is only recently that people have been able to really compute all the, all the series here, but we know the, 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 the next order term. But for the sake of the, 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 the discussion here, I, I only need this term. Now, what happens on the other side? So that means, I yes? Minus. Yeah, so phi minus is some function. It's an explicit function that can be, in this case, one can compute it explicitly. Now, the physical meaning of it, n square phi minus, maybe I will, I will, I will have a picture, a bit more clearer picture later, a bit later, right after that. N square times phi minus is the energy that you need to push your particle on the left of square root of two. Okay? So why is it so? Because you have to remember that this, you remember, I mean, I, I already mentioned that, that this cumulative distribution, I can actually interpret it as the partition function of your Coulomb gas, but in presence of a wall. So now, when the wall is, if W is smaller than square root of two, of course, I mean, the density cannot extend like this up to square root of two. So something much happen. I mean, must, must happen there. The particles need to, re, I mean, the, con the configurations, typical configurations will, be, will look quite different. And that's basically uh, the energy that you need to push all these particles to the left of square root of two. Okay? Now, again, if I have this idea of, uh, um, of uh, pushing pushing particles, uh, if I want to have a lambda max which is much smaller than w, than, than square root of 2. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the probability that lambda max is much, I mean, is, is really far away from square root of 2, then the situation here is quite different because what essentially will happen in this case is that to have one particle which is much uh, on the right of square root of 2, I mean, the typical configurations will be such that n minus 1 particle which sit, will sit inside this uh, Wigner, Wigner C, inside this Wigner semicircle. So most of the particles will be actually between minus square root of 2 and plus square root of 2. And only one particle will be very far away. And this actually, I mean, costs you much less energy because you only need to have one particle which you just get. You, you see, I mean, you have particles which, are, uh, which like to sit in there. But then if you want to have just lambda max much larger than square root of 2, then you only need one particle to be much further from the others. And the energy that you, that, that the cost in energy to do that is simply of order n. We'll see why in a minute. And so that means that, it, so in other words, it's much, it's much easier. I think that this you can more or less feel, I mean, simply because of this uh, uh, repulsive interaction. And as a matter of, of uh, I mean, as a consequence of that, the energy that you, that the, the cost in energy here turns out to be exponential minus n times phi plus of w. And here, okay, it depends a little bit on the model, but uh, okay, and we just, uh, the small O of n here. Usually you will get uh, order one term, in fact, but uh, yeah. <coughs> let, be, let, let me be conservative. <laughs> Is that clear? So again, that means that you have now something like that on the other side, yellow. So you have exponential minus n square on the left and exponential on, uh, exponential minus n on the right. Okay, so this is the right tail, and this is the left tail, okay? So, now, now we, 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 are, we are almost there. I mean, if we want to describe, uh, to describe properly this maze transition, uh, we are almost there because uh, we can now, uh, 
really look at, at what this transition is. Okay, so that's, that, that, that's, that's the result of a rather technical analysis, and I will just comment a bit on the picture later on. Well, no, I mean, they, they are quite different for, for okay, they, there is no, I mean, the only, uh, the, the, okay, the, these problems, these two problems are completely disconnected. The only, th the only reason why I chose to, uh, this example is to basically show the, the um, I mean, to feel a bit the, the, what, what large deviations are. So I look at this problem here, very simple problem. And I showed that typically uh, for this problem, that means where I look at the sum of IID random variables, in the large end limit, uh, I will have, so I have, I am considering uh, a specific random variable, which is the sum of IIDs. And in the large end limit, uh, there will be typically two different regimes. One which, con which concerns the typical fluctuations, which we know from the central limit theorem are typically here of order square root of n. So I'm back to this problem, sorry. Okay, so here you will have, you see, I mean, both agree very well, and that's the Gaussian regime. And now, as I said, you will always have two, at least two different types of regimes. Uh, one which, is, uh, which concerns the typical fluctuations, and the other one that concerns the rare events, or say the large deviations. That means when you are very far away from this uh, n, of, n over two here, and at, at a distance from it, which is much larger than square root of n, say typically over the n in this case, okay? So I was computing the probability that I have no, uh, I mean, for instance, that nh is equal to zero, or nh equal one, which are just the same. And then I showed you that th there, you see, I mean, the, the, the Gaussian approximation is very bad. In a sense, I mean, there is a wide difference between the Gaussian approximation and the exact result, which turns out to be very well described by a large deviation form which typically would have this, this kind of, 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 of form, okay? So the, the, connect, the only connection that, that, that one has is that indeed there is a central regime, which here, so if I look at, you, one should compare this curve here and that curve there, okay? So this one is log, is in log, this one, okay, I, I, I plotted it in, in uh, linear linear, but uh, the meaning is basically, so this part here is described, so the typical fluctuations are tracing with them here, they are Gaussian there, so these are the two. So the equivalent of the central limit theorem Gaussian approximation is basically the tracy rhythm result. And then uh, we know that there will be large deviations and uh, large deviation regimes when you are far away from these typical fluctuations, okay? So that means when you leave this Gaussian here, when you leave this tracy rhythm regime here, you will have a different kind of scaling. So in this problem, the typical scale is square root of n. In that case, the typical scale is n minus two thirds. And when you go uh, far from these uh, from these uh, values, from this scale, you enter different regimes. Now, an important difference between these two models is that the regime from the right on the right and the left, so here on the right and the left, they are quite different, simply because the two problems are different and. Uh, uh, there are strong asymmetries uh, in this problem that you don't have here. And the result is that you have something which is exponential minus n times some function, so which is a bit reminiscent of this, if you want. Okay? Exponential, I, I didn't write it, but it's exponential minus phi plus. I mean, just because otherwise the figure will be a bit uh, messy. But this is this form. Those exponential minus phi plus of w is similar to this guy here. Now on the left, you have another scaling, which is exponential minus n squared times another function. So again, this is a bit similar to this one, okay? But instead of having n, you have n squared. So these are the similarities and differences between, between the two models. But intrinsically, they have nothing, I mean, they don't speak to each other. I mean, they are completely, uh, completely disconnected models. Okay, again, I just show that, took it as an example to introduce large deviations, but not more than that. Is it clear? Okay, so now uh, what, I'm, what I want to stress is that now we, we have a nice characterization of this, uh, of this uh, May transition. And uh, in fact, you see that, uh, okay, so this, uh, yeah.
So that's fine. I think now this I can erase. This we understood more or less. I think you, I hope you have understood that. Uh, now, so that's for the PDF, okay? So that means if I want to look at, okay, this is this is uh, p, p of p of lambda max uh, minus w, smaller than w. So this was okay. This is the PDF. That's the way I want to write it. Uh, now this is what I up to now I called f n of w, the cumulative distribution. So essentially, uh, f n of w of course has this. Uh, uh, okay, it's. it's Fn of w, we know, I mean, uh, there is w equal to square root of 2 here, and it will have this, this kind of form there. Okay. So now I know a little bit more of that because, of course, it converges to 1. Okay. So maybe it's, I wrote it for the PDF because I think it's slightly more natural. Now, for the purpose of what I want to say in a minute, it's better to write it, what it means for Fn of w. So if I am on the left here, that will not change anything, so that will be just exponential minus n square phi minus of w uh, for the for the regime one. Okay, I mean I, I don't want to repeat everything, so that will be regime one, regime two, regime three. So that will be this one in regime one. Okay, uh, then regime, okay, regime two is, is okay, also okay. I mean, this is just F beta of square root of two and to the two third uh, W minus square root of two. So that's the second regime. And then I have a third regime. So here, one has to take care a little bit. Uh, Fn is actually is the, is the integral of this, okay? So again, here this will not change anything at this, at this, at this order. But if you look at that, when w is, uh, of course, when w is larger than square root of 2, the leading term is 1, right? And then there is a small correction, which is given by that. So this is 1 minus exponential of minus n phi plus. Plus small, small n, okay, in the third origin. Is that clear? OK, so it's just another way. I, OK, now, I think that in, from, a from a probabilist point of, from probabilistic point of view, it's probably nicer to, to, to look at the density. So that's why I wrote the things like that. Now, I want to come back to uh, uh, physics. And it turns out that I showed you, I mean, I told you that the, the, the nice fn of w has a nice interpretation of a partition function of your, of, of your system of particles in presence of a wall. So I, I want now to just translate these results for that. Okay. So when you take the derivative with respect to to w, I mean you see that of course if I take the derivative there will be a phi prime. Okay. If you take the derivative of that there will be a term which is minus n square phi minus w times exponential minus n square. But this will introduce some additional powers of n square, which in any case are somewhere there. Okay. There were log n corrections that I didn't even write here. So I, I don't care about this. Here, this is obvious that if I take the derivative, I, ob I observe this. Now, the less uh, obvious statement is this one. But again, we know that fn of w is 1 here when w goes to infinity. And so that's how uh, we should think about this, this guy. Is that OK? OK, so now. Uh, now I really want to understand in detail what this what what this actually tells me uh, uh, in the language of uh, so this f n of w you remember is really the related to the stability uh, probability of stability right in the in the maze problem. So to do that I just want to remind you that this f n of w is essentially the partition function of a Coulomb gas in presence of a wall. And that means that a natural quantity to look at is not Fn strictly, but is more the, the free energy. OK, so this, uh, there is uh, some constant that I don't want to discuss here. And this is like this, right? 
I wrote that already on Saturday. But basically, uh, okay, so you have your weight, your statistical, I mean, Boltzmann weight, and you want to have the probability, again, I remind you that this is the probability that lambda max is smaller than W. So the probability that lambda max is smaller than W is the probability that all the eigenvalues are smaller than W, okay? And so that's, again, uh, the Coulomb, uh, so that's a Coulomb gas, log gas, in presence of a wall. At W. Okay. So, okay, just, I will come back to this part of the blackboard in a while. But I just wrote that uh, to tell you again that this, this quantity here, Fn of W, is a partition function. And the natural object is actually the minus log of Fn of W. Okay, in principle, I have one, minus 1 over beta log of uh, Fn of W is the partition function. Now, usually, in short-range interacting uh, system like Ising or short-range interacting systems in general, this uh, free energy scales like n, the number of particles. Here, the situation is a bit different because uh, you have long-range interacting systems. You have a mean field model. And it turns out that in the large end limit, uh, the good quantity to look at, I mean, the typical free energy is not, it doesn't scale like n, but instead like n squared. Okay, so that's... Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so I want to look at this. Ah. <laughs> Strange. Is a free energy of my system. Okay. Yes, okay. So, okay. Uh, I said it. But uh, I agree that if you look only at this part of the blackboard, it's not very clear. If you look at it, indeed, uh, so in general, the, the free energy, I mean, if you have short-range interacting systems, think about the Ising model, for instance, that's true that one would naively expect that the free energy is, is extensive and is proportional to n. Now, when we have, uh, when you consider long-range interacting systems, this, this is usually not untrue, uh, and the scaling with n might be different, right? And here we are in such situations, right? We have these uh, n particles, they interact with the n each other particle. And uh, plus this is long range because we have a log. So it's ex extremely strong, in fact. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it turns out that in the large n limit, the typical free energy doesn't scale like n, but with like n squared. So that's something that I can say here. Now, in fact, this is also written here, right? Because if you look at this, at this part here, Okay, and if you look at this quantity, so minus log of the of Fn of W. Okay, yeah, maybe I should have. If I make the beta, let me introduce a beta here because otherwise, it, it, it's true. I mean, in the sense that this there is, it's kind of miraculous that this function here does not depend on beta. But okay. Yes, I mean, beta is a parameter. I mean, uh, if you want to, to interpret it, uh, I mean, okay, we write it because it, it has a natural interpretation as an inverse temperature, which is not really, I mean, it's not really, uh, it's, it's just take it as a number. Oh, that's the same. No, no, that's the same. The same here. Yeah, yeah, that's the same everywhere. Yeah, yeah, no, that's actually quite, uh, quite nice. This, this is the same everywhere. Can you read it, what I wrote it? Yeah. So now you see, I mean, if you look at this quantity here, so let's call it, uh, say, F, this is the free energy. So, okay, I want to call it a small Fn of, of omega. Well, from that result, now you see that there is something quite nice because you see that if you take log of this and divide by n square, then obviously, this will just give you phi minus of W. 
Now, if you take log of this and divide by n square, then what you will actually get is something that goes to 0 when n goes to infinity. OK? So <coughs> in other words, if you really look at this fn here, which is this free energy, fn of w, when n goes to infinity, let's forget about the, the, the regime 2, which is extremely, uh, I mean, which, which does not really exist here, I mean, for the purpose of it. But essentially, when w is larger, OK, when w is smaller than square root of 2, you see what I get? Basically, I will get phi minus of w. OK? Which is non zero, which is computable exactly. Now, if you look at what happens on that side, so you have log of 1 minus something which is very small. So log of 1 minus epsilon is basically minus epsilon. So it's exponential minus beta. And you divide it by n square when n is large. And that will be obviously going to 0 exponentially. So on that case, here, on that region here, that simply goes to 0. OK? I don't discuss too much the central regime, which, which is not, at the moment, which, which, which I've not really, uh, I don't want to, to, to study that too much in detail. But so you see that there is actually a phase transition between a phase where you are pushing your system. So this, this is a pushed phase. Maybe I will come back to this in a minute. While this is what, so pushed because you see you are pushing the wall far inside the, 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 the Vigna, the, the edge of the density. Now on that side, I mean, I, as you remember that this actually comes from the fact that there is a single particle that actually goes very far away from the rest. So that's actually a pulled phase. I will comment a bit more on this, on these two, two things here. But now you really have uh, a transition, uh, a phase transition in a, in a thermodynamic, I mean, in a thermodynamic sense, right? This model actually exhibits a phase transition between uh, two phases where the free energy is non-zero and where the free energy is zero as you cross the value square root of two. Okay. Now, if you want to classify, so the, the, the standard classification of uh, so this is a phase transition. So that's actually the May transition. So the transition that May found is actually has actually a very nice thermodynamic uh, interpretation. Now, in the classification of the of, of the of the standard classification, which is due to Ehrenfest uh, of the phase transition, you usually classify the uh, the order of the transition by looking at how, I mean, uh, by looking at the degree of, of uh, uh, discontinuity of, of, this, uh, of, this, of this quantity. So that means that for a first order phase transition, the first derivative of FNW is discontinuous. For a second order phase transition, the second derivative of N of W with respect to W is discontinuous, and so on. So here, so that means that if you want to understand the order of the transition, you need to know how this function behaves when w is close to square root of 2. OK, so in other words, uh, what you get, I mean, so you have these two phases. If, if you really look at fn of w, uh, you would have something like that, right? So there is here a square root of 2. Then you have your function phi minus of w. And essentially, what you see and what you can show is, so you want to know how it does. So here it's 0. And the order of the transition is controlled by the exponent about the behavior of phi minus of w close to square root of 2. Okay, that's the standard. So here it turns out that the behavior is cubic. So what you can show is that this phi minus of w uh, behaves like square root of 2 minus w to the power 3. There is some constant here uh, that you can even compute, but okay, uh, we don't care about it say capital A. So here, that's really crucial here, is that you have uh, a square root of 2 minus w to the power q. Okay. So now, if you look at, OK, if you look at the first derivative of phi minus, uh, on that side is 0, on that other side is 0. If you look at the second derivative, it's 0 there, 
zero there. And if you look at the third order derivative, then you immediately see that the third order derivative of that guy, when w goes to uh, square root of 2 but being negative, has actually a finite value, why it is zero on, that, on the other side. The order of the yeah, it. yes, you can engineer it, but you need to work a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can engineer it. That is true, uh, but this requires uh, quite some work because it turns out that this cubic behavior is is extremely robust. So that means that uh, if you change the potential, for instance, uh, you will okay. Except if you fine tune it in a very specific way, but typically you would observe a, a cubic transition. So this uh, is, is quite universal, but, but here again, I really want to say that, uh, or to mention that the third order derivative of phi minus, or the free energy, if you want, ah, I wanted to keep this. Uh, yes, I still want to keep it. So what I want to say here is that this is the third derivative of uh, d3 dw3 of phi minus w. So that's the first derivative of the free energy is discontinuous because of these three, of course. Huh? Is discontinuous at when you cross uh, w equals square root of 2. Okay, so that means that it has two different values, whether you are slightly uh, above square root of 2 or slightly less than square root of 2. And this means that uh, you have a third order phase transition. Okay, so that's. So let's, let's try to understand this now in a bit uh, on a sort of graph to recapitulate of this. Of this. Okay. So OK, now eventually I will just uh, erase this because, uh, OK, let me write this. So now I, I want to have, I, I have now, I claim that I have now a quite nice description of the phase diagram of this May model. OK, so to, to see that, uh, I will actually plot, so that's the phase diagram of the, the transition of by May. But I want to, to have this phase diagram, so uh, let me <coughs> of May's model. Yeah, I can have it as a function of, of alpha, okay. So I will have these two axes, so please take care. This here, this is alpha, okay? And now on this axis is one over n, okay? So what I said here is that, so essentially this, this is really the, what I am describing here, this part here, is actually the limit when n goes to infinity, and we say that there is a transition here at alpha equals square root one over, so I'm talking about alpha, so this is 1 over square root of 2, OK? And so there is a transition between, say, here, a phase which is stable here at low alpha, at well, low alpha, yes. So here we have a stable phase. OK, when alpha is small. And this somehow corresponds to a weak coupling regime. Now, on the other side here, for large alpha, you have an unstable, an unstable phase. Okay, but of course, this transition only exists at n goes to infinity. So that means only on that line. Okay. So you, you have this, uh, okay, these two regimes basically. But remember that we had for n finite, we had an intermediate regime which was the case where w of minus square root of 2 was of the order n to the power of minus 2. So. so what does it mean? Well, that means that, of course, if you look at your system for finite n, there will be a crossover. And OK, so that would, that would mean that for finite n, you will have uh, a third intermediate region here, which crosses over, uh, which is a crossover, if you want, between the stable and the unstable, the unstable phase. And this crossover is described by the Tracy rhythm. OK, 
Okay, so that's very typical of what happens when you have a phase transition. Effectively, a phase transition only exists in the thermodynamic limit. That means when n goes to infinity, strictly. And for finite n, you will have a region, which is usually uh, characterized by some finite size, finite size scaling, some intermediate region that connects the two, uh, the two fixed points somehow, if you want. Uh, one is the stable one, the other is the, the unstable one. And this intermediate regime is precisely the Tracy Redon regime. Okay? So now, uh, and I will just uh, finish uh, with this. Uh, I just want to understand a little bit more. Uh, yes. <clears throat> okay, that's fine. So, so that's that, that's a very nice picture, I think, of the of the, the maze uh, I mean, maze transition. It's quite simple, um, and you really see the, the the I mean, first that this stability and stability is governed by these random matrix models, and more than that. Uh, so that means, okay, uh, in other words, maybe another picture that we can that that we can sort of. Uh, uh, have is that, so if I look at this uh, distribution, P stable, this time as a function of one over alpha, okay, and just reversing it. So we had this, uh, uh, well, let's do it as, yeah, as a function of one over alpha, otherwise you will be a bit misled. <laughs> so we have seen that we have a specific, so we have this kind of phase transition, right? So that's the, what happens in the large n limit, n goes to infinity from 0 to 1. Now, if you really look at what happens for finite n, of course, you will have a different, uh, you will have a kind of, uh, I should write it not in dotted lines, but maybe really like this. So that's what happens for finite n. And that means that this step function is smeared out over a certain scale, and this scale is pre precisely this one here, right? And this scale uh, is of the order n to the power minus two thirds. Okay, so that means that here you are again uh, in a regime that corresponds to. Um, so this is the Tracy Redon regime. So if you really look at what happens close to square root of two, you will get something which is described in terms of Tracy Redon distribution. Now here, that corresponds to the weak coupling limit. So that actually corresponds here to the stable phase again. So here, I am stable. And here, I am unstable. OK? Now stable actually corresponds to what is known. Uh, I would like, I like to call it a strong, strong coupling regime, because it's a, uh, sorry. I like to, to call it, uh, yes, the, the unsta oh, sorry, sorry, I made it. Uh, uh, no, that's fine, that's fine. So I, I like to think about this regime as the weak coupling regime, okay? So alpha, alpha is, is, is small, and it's stable. On the other hand, when alpha is large, uh, then you are in this, uh, in this unstable regime. Questions? No, 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 it's not vice versa. It's just that here I, s yeah, just, <laughs> okay, here I, I, I plot it as a function of alpha, and here I've plotted as a function of one over alpha. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, indeed, I mean, that's what happens, yes. Yeah. Again, don't forget that this is a model, a simple model, right? If you look at, uh, if you are interested in, if you look at the paper by Maze, I mean, then many, many people have worked on that. And uh, the conclusion that you can draw uh, from this model, uh, I'm not claiming that uh, they are super universal and that they describe all the, the ecological model that, that you will have uh, in the world, right? So uh, for, the, but the, for this model, the statement that you, that, that you made is correct. Yeah, OK. If you don't like it, I mean, just if you want me, I, I, if, you want, if, you, um, if you don't like it, I just can plot it as a function of 1 over alpha, OK? It's not very pedagogic what I did indeed, yes. OK, so let's me, let me correct this. <laughs> OK, that will be just 1 over alpha. You don't need to change so much. That will be square root of 2. That will be stable. 
and that will be unstable. Okay. So that uh, otherwise, yeah, I'm sorry about it. Okay. So again, large coupling, you are unstable. This means this. And uh, strong coupling, uh, weak coupling, sorry, means uh, one over alpha big, and you are in the stable regime. Okay. And this regime that I tried to explain here corresponds to this one. Okay? Is that fine? So, uh, now maybe I, uh, maybe one comment uh, at this stage uh, is that, so we have here a third order phase transition. Uh, as I said, I mean, uh, in statistical physics, uh, this is not very common. Uh, nevertheless, it turns out that in, in high energy physics, uh, people actually have observed this kind of transition. And in fact, uh, the first who did observe this, uh, this transition uh, was in the context of uh, QCD, uh, in the context of uh, young Mills theory on the lattice. And uh, the first actually who observed this third order phase transition was actually uh, in a paper by Gross and Witten in the, in the 80s, and followed up by uh, Spenta Wadia, uh, who also uh, predicted this third order phase transition uh, in this context of uh, young, Mills, uh, young Mills theory, which is completely disconnected a priori uh, from this uh, maze instability of RMT, but it turns out that there are links, uh, which I will not have time to, 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 to explain, but uh, all these models actually uh, with the third order phase transition uh, are actually, um, I mean, closely connected uh, to each other. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe something that uh, I, I wanted, I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to do, I mean, maybe yeah, it's just, it's just uh, let me take five minutes just to explain this a little bit more just by saying an additional word to that, trying to understand this stable to unstable uh, transition. So let me just uh, rephrase a bit what I said here, okay? So that's why I wanted to have it here. So this Fn, let me come back a little bit about this uh, exponential minus n square, exponential minus n because I think they are quite important to understand. And I just want to uh, comment on the fact that here we have a Coulomb gas with a wall, okay? So what does it mean? And what does it mean when you really cross this transition here with the wall, okay? So there are essentially three kinds of, of, uh, of, uh, of situation, right? Because you will see Coulomb gas with the wall. So let's start with the simplest guy. So we know that uh, the, forget about the wall, okay, forget about the wall at the moment. We know that all the particles, they like to sit on this Wigner semicircle here, okay? And now you want, to, you want to, to, add, to add a wall to these guys. So let's look at the situation where W is strictly larger than square root of two. Suppose that you are putting a wall here. Well, obviously, uh, the wall, if it's very far away from square root of two, well, the particles, they don't care about it. And everything, I mean, they will just behave exactly as if this wall would not be there, okay? Now, I told you that uh, if you want to have a large uh, particles that is, that sits at the wall, then basically what, what, what you would have to have is essentially that to take one of those particles and to take it close to the wall. But the rest of the particles is pretty insensitive to this, uh, to this, to this phase, yeah. to, to, to what happens with that wall. So, and if you want to have one particle that really escapes from it, then you really need to pull the charge out of this, okay? But there will be essentially only one particle which, 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 is, uh, which fills this, this wall. So that's, again, what I call the pulled phase. Now let's look on the other hand uh, at uh, the case where instead uh, at equilibrium uh, you would like to have your density like this. Yeah, so here, I mean, you see, I mean, first you put a wall, I mean, okay, if I want to compute Fn of W itself, okay, so there are two things on this figure. If you want to compute Fn of W, it's a part, it's, this is the partition function of the, uh, of the wall, of the Coulomb gas, 
in presence of the wall. But if the wall is very far away from square root of two, it will have no effect, right? Because all the particles with probability one in the large n limit, they sit on this minus square root of two plus square root of two, okay? So that's one thing. And that's why actually, if you remember, fn of w in that limit, when w is larger than square root of two, the leading term is one. The leading term is one because it's simply, this integral here is exactly the, at the same value as the value w equal to infinity. Okay? That's why it's it just one. There were corrections to it. Now, what are the corrections? And this is, now I ask the question, how can I have one particle which is very far away from square root of two, sitting at w? What will happen is that you take one of the particle, one of these particles, you just put it here very far away, but the rest of the n minus one particle, they are just stay quietly uh, between minus square root of two and plus square root of two, okay? So you are, if you really want to have a large lambda max, you really need to pull this, uh, this gas here and one particle will actually just uh, go away from, from the Wigner semicircle. Is that clear? And all the other particles will sit, all the other ones, they will sit uh, gently here, right? Uh, I don't want to disturb them because otherwise it will cost me a huge amount of energy. So I just take one of them, and the energy that I need to do that is basically proportional to n. Why is it so? because these particles is interacting with the n minus one other particle, and basically that's the cost of energy that you need, right? One particle which interacts with n other ones. That's the origin of this, of this, uh, of this n, okay? So the energy to do that uh, is proportional to n. Now let's look at the other, the other situation where instead now you put a wall which is here. Now this, this is really another story, so you push this wall, okay? And now at some point, okay, you will cross square root of two, and then you end up in, in that phase here. So obviously here, I mean, the particles, I mean, they cannot, they cannot stay there, and the resulting uh, density will be quite different, and the true density will more look like that. There will be some accumulation. So the density will diverge close to the wall, simply because you are pushing it. You're pushing this gas, they cannot stay there. So that the equilibrium density without without the wall. Okay? And so you are pushing it, and as I said, in order to accommodate to the presence of the wall, the particles will need to rearrange drastically. And because we know that uh, they are all interacting with, with, with each other, and the, the interaction term is of that form, sum over ij log of lambda i minus lambda j, they are just, all the particles will be involved in, this, in these changes, and that will essentially cost you an energy which is proportional to n squared. Okay, so that's obviously a case where instead you are pushing your gas, and this is the pushed phase. And the energy needed uh, to do that is proportional to n, to, um, to n squared. Okay, so that's why here the probability will be of, of typically of the order exponential minus n squared while here it will be of the order exponential minus n. And then in between, of course, you have a critical, you have a critical case where you are the place where the wall is exactly at square root of two. Okay. And that's basically the Tracy rhythm point. So Tracy rhythm is actually exactly like a critical point, if you want. Right, so at square root of two, so you put the wall at W equals square root of two, and this one uh, is critical. you have the critical, you have the pulled phase, and you have the pushed phase. Okay? Now it turns out that this Tracy rhythm distribution is sort of universal because it has more or less the same universality as critical phenomena. Okay, we know that at critical phenomena, I mean, at, in the vicinity of a critical point, uh, you are only depend on the sort of microscopic behavior of the system, and that is why many systems 
somehow display this, this Tracy rhythm distribution. Okay. Now, of course, if you begin to change the interactions, if you begin to change, and um, specifically the interactions, things are uh, different, and you might observe different kinds of transition. Nevertheless, still in many cases, you also observe uh, uh, third-order phase transitions. Uh, and there are a recent series of, of work by uh, Pier Paolo Vivo, for instance, and co-workers um, who have been investigating this, the, the generality and the generalization of this third-order phase transition. Uh, we have also uh, generalized it to many, many problems. Uh, and so what is quite nice here is that somehow you can grasp a little bit the origin of the universality of Tracy rhythm, which is connected to uh, the universality of, of phase transitions. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so you can, of course, so Coulomb gas in higher dimensions. So for instance, OK, there are very, several things that, 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 that you can con, con, consider. So one is, the, I think, that w the one that you are, meant, that you are uh, discussing is the case where the, the true 2D Coulomb gas, for instance. So now you really take particles in the plane, and they are interacting via the true Coulomb gas interaction, the two-dimensional, say, the, the logarithmic, but in 2D. Okay, so which is the true one. Now in that case, it term, it, it's nice also this model because it's connected to another set of random matrices. The simplest one, actually. So if you take uh, just uh, random matrices without any symmetries, say they are complex because it's the nicest, the nicest example, uh, then in that case, uh, you just, so you fill your matrix n by n without any symmetry, just random Gaussian numbers, real and complex independent. And then you look at the distribution of the eigenvalues. They will sit, of course, in the plane. They are not real anymore. They will be spread out of the complex plane. Now, it turns out that the, the law of these eigenvalues is precisely the law of the, uh, what is called the one component, two-dimensional one component plasma. That is the, the, like the, the position of the particles uh, uh, interacting via the 2D, 2D, 2D Coulomb gas. So you can ask similar questions. Uh, and you will find again similar, so for instance, you could say, I mean, in 2D, you can say, okay, what's the probability that they all, so here, I mean, you say, I want to confine them on a segment, I mean, on, on, a, on a half line, yeah, exactly, so you, you, you insist on having them uh, on a certain radius, and then you will observe similar things, okay? So you will also observe, in fact, a third order phase transition, except that there you lose, actually, the, the, the Tracy rhythm. There are some other laws there. Sorry? Yeah, it's again a sort of the phase transition. So this has been discussed uh, uh, by uh, Vivo and, and, and co-workers. And uh, also Fabio, Fabio Kunden. Now, something that you can also look at, uh, this is something that we have done more recently, uh, is, is you can also look at the true one-dimensional Coulomb gas. So instead of taking the log, you really take the mod, mod modulus of xi minus xj. And you will also again find another third order phase transition. And uh, with other type of laws, uh, this is not Tracy rhythm there, this is something related to it. I mean, not related, I mean, of the same flavor, but, but uh, unrelated. Uh, and it seems that it's quite robust, yeah. So maybe I will end uh, with discussing some, uh, some applications of Tracy rhythm. Um, okay, it's, it's certainly a very long, uh, it's a quite long story. Um, okay, maybe I will sort of start with uh, the application that I prefer, because it was also the, so, okay, so to say, um, this Tracy rhythm distribution basically was discovered in 94, uh, and then, okay, it was there, but uh, it was like something a bit mathematical, okay. And then uh, it turns out that uh, at the end uh, of the 90s, uh, in 1999 actually, uh, a beautiful result uh, came out uh, from three, three uh, great mathematicians, Baik, Dave, and Johansson, uh, who actually discovered that uh, this, this Tracy rhythm distribution actually arises in a completely different problem, which is in principle also of mathematical nature which has to do with the random permutations of numbers. Okay, so I just want to show this application because it's, it's quite striking. I don't know whether you will like it, but... Uh, and from that on, people realized that uh, 
Uh, this result actually has many applications in various models of statistical mechanics, and in particular in the carbar paris uh, equation. Um, and that's, uh, that was really the starting point. Okay. So this, let me just uh, finish this, these things on RMT with that. Um, but that's really, uh, so, and then started a very nice story, I mean, uh, where uh, people really realized that this, cape, this uh, Tracy rhythm is, is uh, extremely robust and appears in, in a huge, uh, huge uh, variety of problems. Uh, we recently showed that, uh, for instance, it appears also in the, in the, the problem of free fermions. Uh, in some question, probably, that, uh, I don't know, Maurizio briefly mentioned, but... Um, it has been found in finance, it has been found in uh, uh, wireless, uh, I mean, all these people who are, who are looking at these uh, wireless uh, communication problems. Uh, so it's extremely nice, and uh, I just want to finish with this. Uh, so again, in one of the, I mean, in the reference that I, in one of the two references that I gave, uh, okay, we, we did that in a rather, uh, Okay, you will find a more exhaustive list of applications. Now here I want to discuss the sort of, I think the, the problem which, which really started this, this, this long story. And this has to do with the longest increasing sub subsequence. Uh, of, of a random permutation. So the idea is, is so what, what, what do, I, do I call by random permutation? So uh, I just take uh, n numbers uh, and uh, basically uh, there will be factorial n of permutations of, this, of these numbers. And I consider the simplest case where all these permutations are just uh, they have a uniform weight, okay? So each permutation arises with a probability which is one over factorial n, okay? So this is my set, this is my set of, of uh, random numbers. If you want, you, you just say, okay, I just look at all the permutations and then uh, I want to do some statistics on it. Now, this problem actually is quite, is, is, is very old. It's due, in fact, initially to Ulam uh, from the 60s, 70s. And uh, let's illustrate it on a, on a simple example. So let's take, for instance, n equal to, to 8. So this is this LIS problem, right? Uh, now it's, it's very famous. So, and you draw, you draw one permutation, uh, one random permutation. Okay, so for instance, one element, I will, I will, I will just uh, call it, uh, say, uh, sigma. Uh, will be this one. Okay, so that's one of these permutations. Three, seven, four, five, one, two, six, eight. Okay, so this is one, one of these permutations. And now I want to consider the, I want to, in, to first consider increasing subsequences. So what is an increasing subsequence? Well, increasing subsequence in this in this thing here. So you just select. So you just scan this, uh, this, um, this permutation and you select a series of numbers which are ordered by, uh, I mean, increasingly. So for instance, uh, one uh, increasing subsequence, let's let's try to see uh, one of them. So for instance, I would have, uh, Say this one, uh, seven, eight is one of them. Okay, so this is one. I probably can find another one. Uh, yes, there is another one, for instance. Uh, I would have uh, four, five, so I need to increase. So one is not possible, two is not possible, six is possible. And if I want, I can, I can have eight. Sorry? Yeah, okay, I can also take the three. Yeah, this is yet another one. Okay, so this is, okay, I had one. So this was the blue one. Is 
seven, eight. Uh, this one, five, four, five, six, eight. But of course, I could have only four, five. I could have four, six, eight. I mean, all of these subsequence are also acceptable. And then you find uh, you found another one. Uh, you want now to take the three. Okay, very good. This one I like it. So this is the three, four, five, six, eight. Okay. Now three, four, five. Sorry. Five, six, eight. So you will have a certain number of uh, increasing subsequences, and now you look at the longest one. Okay. So in fact, the last one that you gave me is the longest one. Okay. So you look at the longest. Uh, the longest sequence, and this is the longest increasing subsequence. Yes? No, because they are permutations. Yes, so this is not possible because they are permutations. So all the numbers here will be different. Okay, so I take this, I, I, I take the numbers between 1 and 8, or 1 and n in general. I just permute them, shuffle them. This is actually, of course, related to some shuffling card, card shuffling problems. Uh, and this uh, eventually. Uh, so that means that, that they are all different, OK? But nevertheless, you can still have uh, several longest uh, increasing subsequence, OK? So it might be that, uh, OK, here I have not investigated it in details, but uh, this is the, th there might be several longest increasing subsequence. And you look at the length of it, OK? So, uh, so this, is, this is the longest one. So this was a very old problem in, in uh, I mean, longest increasing subsequence. And you look at its length, OK? Its length is uh, here LL n equal to 8. So here is L8 is 1, then it's 5, OK? And then you, you just. Um, Select another uh, random permutation, and you do the same exercise, and you look at the length. So ln will be a random variable, and you ask what's the probability uh, distribution of this of this L, ln. Okay. So more generally, ln uh, is basically the yeah, ln is the length of the LIS. Okay. And you want to, to, to know the statistics of this guy. Now, that means that you would like to know the statistics of, of it. That means uh, you want to compute, uh, basically, th this quantity here. I, I call it P, small n, capital N. Uh, that will be the property, the probability that this LN here is, say, smaller than uh, some value. Smaller. So it's the length of the longest subsequence that you can construct from a given permutation. OK? So this problem was there for a long time. And uh, people had uh, partial results. For instance, it was known that uh, uh, LN, uh, in, uh, we, people knew this uh, its uh, asymptotic value when n goes to infinity. In fact, Ulam himself. Uh, knew this result, and he had shown that this was two square root of n. This was, I think, I think Ulam, Ulam had this. Had this. So also this problem was sitting a bit. I mean, uh, no one, uh, okay, had a very uh, nice ideas of how to compute that or say something about it. Now, uh, in, in 99, uh, these uh, three uh, people, by I just mentioned their name because, well, first there are three of them. Uh, brilliant uh, mathematicians, and they showed the remarkable result that came in 99. They actually showed that this LN here, if you look at it in a correct way, is actually related to Tracy Widom. Okay. So what they showed is that uh, this, uh, this guy here, this PNN in the large N limit, you can write it as, and it, it's actually in this case, this is F2, so that's actually uh, n minus uh, 2 square root of n. 
divided, and again you have n well, one six. And this is actually uh, well, F two is a tracy reading. So that was quite a surprise because at that time, of course, uh, there was no eigenvalues there. I mean, or at least uh, it's not very clear to see random matrices, although they are. But uh, there are some uh, random matrix behind this problem. But more than that, uh, there are many problems, in fact, in statistical mechanics uh, that can be related to it. And I will uh, mention one of them. It was known that this LIS problem, which is pretty mathematical, is actually related to a directed polynomial problem. Okay. And that's how it started. And that's why people became extremely uh, interested uh, in these results. So it turns out that this uh, random sequence, uh, I mean, this uh, permutation problem is actually related to a, to a, to a polymer model. Yeah? Well, uh, yes, so that means that the average value will be 2 square root of n. In fact, that means even here, given that the fluctuations, so it's a bit like in random matrices. In fact, uh, what it means that is that if you take very long, I mean, n very large, OK? And uh, if you take, uh, just take at random a random permutation, and you look at the longest increasing subsequence, yeah, indeed, with probability 1, it will be of this order 2 square root of n. Now, there will be some fluctuations around it. The fluctuations are of that order, n to the power 1 over 6. And these fluctuations will be given by Tracy Whedon. OK? So in other words, uh, what's the translation of that? Good question. So if I look at ln as a random variable, when n is large, then typically, this is just a, a deterministic random number. So that would be our a n, if you want, 2 square root of n. And then there is a b n. And here bn is just 1 over 1 sixth times a random number. And this random number is just chi 2. That means this is the tracy rhythm. So this is a random variable which is distributed according to tracy rhythm distribution for beta equal 2 for the GUE ensemble. OK? It's not. Is it clear? So indeed, in the large n limit, you see, I mean, this term, so what I said. My answer was that when n is large, this one is much larger than this. So that means that the fluctuations are much smaller than, than the, the deterministic part. And so typically, if you take a random permutation, the length of the longest increasing subsequence would be typically 2 square root of n. OK. So now, why uh, is it interesting beyond the, uh, the, the, the purely mathematical uh, framework? Now, it turns out that there is a nice relation to a polymer model. So how does it work? And that's, that was actually already known. Uh, and that, that's called, actually, the Hammersley pass process. Hammersley was a mathematician of the same, uh, the same time as, as Ulam. So let me rephrase this, 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 this longest increasing subsequence. So for instance, we had n equal to 8, right? So let's do, let's consider a squared grid of, of, of size 8, right? So we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. OK? So. So here this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this is, say, uh, again, 1 here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. OK, so let's consider one permutation. OK, just for clarity, I just uh, s consider this permutation sigma, which is the one that I gave you. OK, so that was 3, 7, 4, 5, 1, 2. 6, 8. So what does it mean, actually? I mean, that means that sigma of 1 is equal to 3. Sigma of 2 is, is OK? So this is sigma of, sigma of 1. Uh, this is sigma of 2. Uh, this is sigma of 3, etc. OK? So let's just uh, draw this, this, these numbers. 
So sigma of 1 is 3, so it's here. Uh, sigma of 2 is 7, it's there. Uh, sigma, of, uh, sigma of 3 is 4, uh, so I will be here. And then I am in 5, and then I am in 1, and then I am in 2, and then I am in 6, and eventually I am in 8. Okay, very good. So these are the, these points here, and I want to construct a path. And the path actually will be uh, directed in the sense that uh, I can just, uh, so suppose that I'm looking at the, the, the typical path, so they have to be oriented in the sense that uh, I, at each time step, so if I start from this point, for instance, uh, I can only go to the right and up. Okay, so that means that here, if I'm here, for instance, I could go here. And then when, once I am here, the only point where I can go is this one, and I am done. Okay? So I have, I'm just looking at the directed path. Okay? So let's add, for clarity, a nines and, 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 look, and let's look like one of these uh, increasing subsequence. Okay, so for instance, there is this subsequence that uh, we mentioned. I don't know, one of them. So I want to represent one of these increasing subsequence. So for instance, uh, one that I wanted, which is, which is nice, for instance, is this uh, one, two, eight. Okay, so I have one. Okay, let's, let's, let's draw it. It will be this one. One, two, eight. This is one of them, right? So I have these points. So I start, uh, I have this point here. So this is one is there, actually. And then uh, I move to two, so I move here. And then I move to this one. So this is my, my sequence here. And then, OK, I will add a starting point and then and, and an end point. So this is the, addition, the additional construction. So I have an ending, a starting point here and an ending point there. So in other words, that would be here one of this, one of this path. OK? Is that fine? So I put these points, and now the criterion is that I am doing a random walk, which at each time steps can only go first to the right, and then it has to be uh, it has to go is that it has to go up. Okay, so it's a directed path. Okay, so that's uh, the path process, and it's directed, and then I want to see this blue path here as a directed polymer. Okay, it's a polymer that starts here and there, and it is directed because of the reason that I said. Okay, so you need only, all the paths that you need to, to you need to go always in that direction. So it's always basically east and north. Okay, I can just go in, in this direction. So you can never go down, and you can never go west. So if you think a little about it, all these paths are in bijection with the increasing subsequences of your permutation, okay? So that gives you one, one type of, of polymer. So in other words, the increase in subsequence is in bijection with uh, a lattice pass, which, is a poly which, is, which, I which I want to see as a polymer. And now, I want to consider the optimal polymer how do I do that? Now, I will say that to each of these polymers, I attach an energy, and the energy is basically the number of points that you have touched. Okay? That's my model. Okay? That's, that's my polymer model. So now the energy uh, of the pass of the polymer is basically the number of points that you have encountered. The number of points that you have touched. OK? And now, obviously, the question that you ask is, OK, I want to look at the optimal energy. That means the energy which has the highest energy, the, the, the path that has 
the highest energy, and the part that has the highest energy is precisely the longest increasing subsequence. And the energy associated to this part is the length of this longest increasing subsequence. So in other words, the energy of the optimal path is just ln. And that tells you that the energy, OK, let's write it this way. So that's, that, that was one of the connections, if you want, that uh, made people realize that this was indeed a, a very nice uh, and, and breakthrough uh, result here. So uh, now you would say that the optimal, the optimal, uh, optimal path is basically uh, the path uh, with highest energy. OK, that means the path with highest number of points. OK, and it is in bijection then with the longest increasing subsequence by definition. Now, the energy of this optimal path is precisely ln. Okay. And in other words, that tells you that of the optimal path is actually precisely ln. And it means that the typical fluctuations of ln are described by Tracy Whedon. Here, beta equal 2. At that moment, people didn't know why it was beta equal 2. But this is the special geometry somehow here that we are considering. You see I have a polymer that has one fixed end and that ends up here uh, at also at one fixed end. So this is called the point-to-point -point geometry. But so you see then uh, that we have a poly directed polymer model. Then based on universality arguments, uh, one can probably uh, think that this um, specific result, so I see we don't results, fluctuations, so that this specific result for a specific model uh, will actually be still valid for a wider class of uh, uh, polymer model, and that was indeed shown later on that this is indeed the case, so that means that people then have looked at various kinds of directed polymer models. Some of them could be solved exactly. Uh, Johansson uh, played a, a very important role in, this, uh, in these developments. He actually solved uh, another, another model with which, for which he, he found a very nice connection to RMT, namely in terms of uh, Wishart, Wishart Lager uh, ensembles. Now, it turns out that this model, OK, I didn't show it, but you probably know that, or you, I don't know if you know it, but usually these directed polymer models, they also have, they can be mapped onto stat stochastic growth process within the, the KPZ universality class. And so this model actually essentially can be mapped uh, onto a model which is known under the name of the uh, PNG model, polynuclear growth model, which was eventually solved by uh, Spohn uh, in 2000. Uh, and, uh, that was really the, 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 the beginning of uh, uh, wide explorations, uh, I mean, a wide field uh, of research around, this, uh, around this, uh, these problems centered around the Tracy wheel. Okay, so I think that my time is okay. Now I can take some questions, but uh, that's, that's the only thing that I want to tell you. Uh, I don't have a very nice, uh, I don't have a simple way to get it, although it, this might exist, but uh, I, I don't know it. If it exists, I don't know it. In any case, it's not trivial. Even this term is not, is not trivial. So now, okay, it, it corresponds to the edge of, of Tracy Widom, but of, of the, the Wigner semicircle, but of course, here there is no, no random matrix. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you.